To close out our careers, we have chosen to take advantage of this ceremony to bring you here and to show you your Army. Let me tell you a little bit about what you see before you, this formation on display on the floor here. This is your Army. It comes from every state and territory in the nation. They are volunteers, swearing to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Imagine that, volunteering to join an army that has been at war for 17 years. And they come from the very best of our youth. Here's a statistic that you should be familiar with. When considering the population of Americans who are aged 17 to 24, when considering all of them across the country, across the United States, your neighbors, friends, families, workers, all of them, only 25% can join the army. Just one in four can wear this uniform. 75% are disqualified because they're not a high school graduate, or they have a drug problem, a criminal record. They're obese, they have a disqualifying physical limitation, or they simply can't meet the minimum physical fitness standards. So the formation in front of you represents all of those who have volunteered from that 25% to serve the nation, to serve you, to protect your freedom, our values, our way of life. Another thing about your army is it is diverse. And I don't mean a token ethnic or gender minority here and there. I mean there is opportunity for everyone. And it is integrated and mature and part of our very fabric. One of the more challenging assignments I had a few years ago was to conduct the investigation into the circumstances of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl's absence in Afghanistan and his subsequent activity. It was a very complex task and I required a great deal of help. So I reached into the Army and I pulled together professional investigators, finance experts, intelligence analysts, computer techs, forensic psychiatrists, a survival and escape psychologist, two lawyers, a paralegal, a court recorder, a human resource specialist, an infantry platoon sergeant. It was a team of 22 people. And the remarkable thing was, when we sat down for our first meeting, there was every possible demographic staring me in the face at the table. All ethnicities, all races, all genders, in nearly equal portions. It was striking to me that this occurred in the normal course of selecting from the best of our talented soldiers. It was not by design, but was simply a reflection of our army, of your army. Another thing about your army is that it is tough, and it must be tough, and again, I'll turn to the Armed Forces officer. Americans in combat do not have to be pampered, spoon-fed, and surfeited with every comfort and convenience to keep them steadfast and devoted once war comes. They are by nature rugged, and in the field will respond most perfectly when called on to play a rugged part. Soft handling will soften even the best of them, but even the weak one will develop a new vigor and confidence in the face of necessary hardship, if moved by a leadership which is courageously making the best of a bad situation. Your soldiers are rugged, and they need to be. They must thrive in austere and Spartan environments. You should expect that of them. Do not coddle them, and treat them softly, but support them and have high expectations of them as the Army toughens them up to serve you. Now today I have for the final time the microphone, so I do have a call to action for you, and I want to ask three things of you. First, encourage people to join your army. It's a great life. Celia and I have loved it. We are stronger and better people for it, and our family has thrived being part of the army culture. It's a good, good life filled with purpose and meaning, and you are surrounded every day by wonderful, quality people who care for one another. Second, I ask you to consider some type of service yourself and encourage others to serve outside the military. It could be in the State Department, the Environmental Protection Agency, law enforcement, as a school teacher, a judge, a public defender, some other public sector, or in a health profession. It can be working with a nonprofit, volunteering in your community, helping your neighbor, perhaps addressing some of those vulnerabilities to our youth that I mentioned earlier. Service is fundamental to the common good and is a demonstration of our love for one another. Here are a few examples. The priest who gave the invocation today is Father John Mudd, who is a very dear friend and has been a mentor 
and he has dedicated his life of service in support of the challenged youth of Washington, D.C. In addition to that, along with Sister Michael Bucknowski, who is also present today, they have served the religious community of Fort Belvoir and the Army for more than 30 years. Also here today are Fred and Judy Wilpon and Dick and Mary Oletta, who have become more than close friends and are now considered part of our family. Our association with them began with Fred Wilpon's passion for connecting the talent and resources of the private sector to help close the gap and meet some of the critical needs of our veterans and their families. And Miss Betsy Schultz is here, a Gold Star mother who lost her son Joseph, a Special Forces captain in Afghanistan several years ago. And Betsy then shut down her very popular bed and breakfast in Port Angeles, Washington, and converted it to provide a respite for those who have lost a family member to combat. None of them are in uniform, but what excellent examples they are of selfless service to others. God has blessed our great nation with freedom, equality, prosperity, and opportunity, and we need our best talent to be serving the public good in order to preserve those blessings. So first, encourage military service, and second, support and consider service of all kinds. And third, in a moment, I want you to join me in showing appreciation to your army, to this spectacular formation of the old guard in front of you, and also to our future. There are a couple young soldiers sitting among you that are the children of close family and friends. And I don't mean to embarrass you two guys, but I'm still a general and you're not, so humor me at least for a few more days. From the Corps of Cadets at Virginia Tech, Army ROTC senior Jacob Moberly, and from Cornell University, Army ROTC senior Cadet Jack Elrod. Gentlemen, please stand. So you can see that Celia and I love the Army. And I was warned about that by Secretary of Defense James Mattis, who at the time was a retired general. He said, KD, one day the Army is going to break your heart. You love the Army, as we all love our service. We have to love it in order to make the sacrifices required and endure, and, and endure the necessary hardships. You can't have one foot in the water. You have to be all in to do what you do. And that leaves you vulnerable when it ends. And it is going to end, whether you leave voluntarily, or asked to leave, or simply retire when the time comes. Well, that time has come. And the best piece of advice then General Mattis gave me was, it's not personal. When the Army breaks your heart, don't stop loving the Army. And we won't. Celia and I have run through the tape. We have been at this for 40 years, but it started when we were just 17, so we're not that old. <laughs> we have to face the facts that as rewarding as it has been, it has not been easy. And this, at this juncture, we find ourselves physically, emotionally, and intellectually spent. We are very satisfied that we left nothing on the table and there was no gas in the tank. And yet, somehow, we are stronger than ever for it, spiritually, in our marriage, and in our relationships with family and friends. So before we move on to something else, we will take a couple of gap years to recover. Two months ago, the moving van drove away from our quarters at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, with all of our things, and they went into long-term storage for two years. We are now homeless. <laughs> our first stop is Peekskill, New York, where I grew up. I've been gone so long that I don't even call it Peekskill anymore. It has a new name, Cortland Manor. My brother Ozzy owns the house that we grew up in, and his, he and his wife Donna are kind enough to let us spend mo four months there, where we'll take inventory of our lives and reflect on how we've spent it so far. After that, we have already booked a month vacation rental on the North Shore of Hawaii, and are locking in four month stays in San Diego, Tuscany, Bavaria, Montana, and New Hampshire before we return here to Alexandria, Virginia, and move back into our home here, where Celia grew up. Then we'll be recharged and ready for some new purpose. So we'll take the next couple of years to be alone,
together and to recover before we move on. And no, you can't visit. These are all one-bedroom places, and the contract says no visitors. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to share this moment with us. God bless you, God bless America, and God bless the United States Army.
ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the Army Song. The United States Army is honored to have presented today's special ceremony. Guests are welcome to express best wishes to General Dahl and his family in a receiving line on the ceremonial floor immediately following the ceremony. Please allow the Dahls a brief moment to transition and follow the general direction of the protocol staff.